Hi, everyone. Welcome to our CARTIS webinar series, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ashley Winter. I'm a director here at CARTIS, based in the UK, and I'm really pleased to be moderating this session for you all today. We are continually developing our webinar series to address a variety of different topics which are currently impacting the mobility industry. If you didn't manage to attend one of our previous webinars, you will find all of the recordings, along with this one, in our COVID-19 content hub on CARTIS.com. Our focus for today is on relocation, insights and innovation in the age of COVID-19. And we've got some really great industry leaders on the panel who are all looking forward to sharing their experiences and their insights with you today. Before I go ahead and introduce them, I just wanted to take a few moments to address some key housekeeping items. If you are having any technical issues at all, please drop off the webinar and rejoin. The call is being recorded and it will be available for future viewing. As attendees, you are in listen mode only, but if you have a question, please use the question feature and voting function in Microsoft Teams. I know that the panel have lots of great insights to share today, so if we're not able to get to some of your questions, we'll be sure to circle back with our panellists to get their perspective on the top rated questions, and we'll send out some of the information afterwards as a follow up to everyone who was able to join us today. OK, so let me introduce you to our panel of industry experts and then we'll get started. So joining us today, we have Don Mugavaro, Senior Manager in Talent Mobility with Toyota Motor North America. Marissa Johnson, Global HR Manager with Textron. Katrina Helmkamp, our very own President and CEO at Cartis. And Alex Harris, Vice President of Global Talent Mobility, also here at Cartis. So thank you very much to all of our panelists and let's get started. Don, I'm going to come to you first with a question. So could you share a bit about how COVID-19 has impacted you and your teams from a business perspective? And thinking both in terms of day-to-day -day as well as the top level strategy. Sure, thank you, Ashley. And good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, thank you for allowing me to join today and share Toyota's uh, journey uh, with COVID-19. So I, I think as everyone did, we went into crisis planning mode. We developed a crisis management team and our first questions were, how is this going to impact us and how do we keep our team members safe? Like other companies, we have a very diverse workforce. We have manufacturing operations as well as administrative operations. So a one-size-fits-all approach wasn't going to work. We really had to look across our operations and populations to determine the unique needs of each and develop response plans accordingly. Accordingly, Our first manufacturing site actually shut down on March 21st, a decision that was not made lightly, but for the safety of our team members. So since that time, all of our plants have been dark. We've not been producing vehicles since that time. But in the interim, with some of our, our production facilities, we have been able to um, manufacture, manufacture some PPE, face masks and shields and such. So some of our team members have remained um, productive, but for the most part, the plants are shut down and we're certainly not producing any, any vehicles. The plants have just resumed operations this week and doing so with a very structured set of protocols and a completely redesigned set of SOPs. So you can imagine for manufacturing plants with very sophisticated assembly lines, this has been no small feat. And then there are suppliers. We've had to ensure that they are ready and able to provide the materials and parts necessary to produce our vehicles. So having the supply chain up and running has also been another challenge. Then on the administrative side, the first questions were, how do we we ensure the safety of our team members and how do we mobilize a remote workforce? For Toyota, this is a very unfamiliar territory because as a company, we have not historically embraced remote work. Toyota is a very traditional um, culture and we place high value on presence and collaboration. So this has really been an unprecedented endeavor for us. We've had to quickly stand up new and or enhanced technology to now support a very large remote workforce. So on the administrative side, you know, that has been our focus. But then we have also our field uh, uh, employees, our field team members. We've got what we call field travelers. These are team members 
to support our dealers. They spend most of their time traveling from dealer to dealer. So how do we ensure their safety? How do we rethink their role? How, how does their work change uh, now in the, in the age of COVID-19? And then there's our marketing campaigns. How do these need to change? What focus do we need to have um, when we communicate to our consumers? How do our dealers now sell cars? So we've had to really rethink what we do and how we do it across the entire company. Now there are many, many work streams currently in place tackling all of these challenges, ensuring the safety of our team members first and foremost as they return to work, developing new strategies, redesigning work, implementing new policies and programs. So in a nutshell, it's safe to say the situation has turned our world completely upside down. Everything from building the vehicle to selling it and everything in between has been completely impacted um, and, and being looked at for complete redesign. As a mobility team, we too have not, have not worked remotely. So this is a whole, whole new experience for us. It has really for, 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 forced us to focus on what's really important. It strengthened our communication, challenged us with creative problem solving, taught us how to connect differently, how to engage differently, um, how to have virtual birthday party celebrations, although this is something that we, we need to perfect a little bit. And while we have missed the richness of the face-to-face -face interaction and are certainly looking forward to getting back to work, we have also learned that we can work differently and be just as productive. We have learned that if you don't need to be, that you don't need to be present to be productive. How do we make decisions without having all of the information and not knowing when you will have it? And that sometimes, not, and that it's sometimes nice not to have to do your hair and makeup or dress in shorts and flip flops. So we've really challenged ourselves in, in in many different ways to engage differently, to communicate differently, to problem solve. Um, and now we wonder how we occupied our time before COVID. So lots of work has been done and continues to be done to develop new policies, resources, communication strategies, all around a new way of approaching work. And, and I think it's really about changing our mindset. So today, I think there are more questions than there are answers. So if, if anyone was looking for some magic, uh, you know, uh, uh, solutions from, from me today, we don't have them yet. We're beginning to work on them just as all of you are. And as we begin to emerge from crisis management mode in responding to the immediate crisis, moving to recovery mode and focusing, focusing on what our return to work looks like, to then focusing on, on long-term sustainable changes and future strategies, I think there'll be much more reflection on our experience, its impacts, and how it changes our thinking moving forward. We will certainly spend more time considering how we view mobility in the future. How do we deploy resources? What drivers have changed? How does this impact our service delivery model? How can we accomplish the same business objectives through a different approach? Are team members even going to be willing to go on long-term assignments, or will they see that risk is too great? So we think there's lots more learning to be had and lots more discussion that needs to take place as we continue to move through this unprecedented journey. Thanks, Dawn. It certainly sounds like you've taken away a lot of good key learnings from um, you know, the different processes that you've put in place and that your employees have, have all started to adapt. So that's great. Um, moving to you, Marissa, how does your experience compare um, how have your employees adjusted and adapted? Has it impacted your business? Sure. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to join. Similar to Dawn, Textron has not historically been a company that has supported a remote workforce. And part of that is because we manufacture products. And so as a result, you just simply can't do that remotely. For some background on Textron, in case you may not know, Textron makes helicopters. We make airplanes, private jets, we make fuel tanks, golf carts, uh, we make equipment for uh, maintaining golf courses. So it's a pretty diverse business line. And because of that, we have different industries or different businesses that are in different industries. So some of our businesses were hit a little bit harder than others with the economic downturn. 
some of our lines that focus on making fuel tanks, for example, and golf carts, many of them shut down uh, during this crisis. We have several government contracts, though, with our other business lines. We have individuals who are embedded with the military in various locations around the globe. And so as a result, we were not able to cease production for some of those contracts to which we are held. And so we had to make some quick changes in crisis mode to ensure that our manufacturing facilities that had to remain open could remain open safely with individuals still going into work. So I'd say in terms of focusing on um, the business, the first and foremost thing was what lines have to stay open and how are we going to modify work for those individuals to ensure their safety? And alternatively, the support staff in the offices who support those individuals, how are they going to effectively support those people while we're still trying to maintain some business activity? So crisis mode, that was certainly one of the first things that we addressed. And then I think secondarily, we're looking at the office um, folks and and we did not have a lot of technology. We did not have a lot of focus on how do you work remotely in the most effective manner. And so our, we had to shift as a company and do a lot of scrambling initially. We didn't have enough VPN bandwidth for everyone to work from home. So that was a challenge initially. So certainly we, we, we also, like Dawn, had to go into crisis mode a little bit and just first of all, get people so they had the ability to work. And then I think in the past several weeks, we've seen a better focus on how do you work more effectively? As a team, a global mobility team, we are spread out already as it is. So this wasn't exactly a huge change for my team. Certainly from a workload perspective, it has been a huge change, but we were already spread out in four different states around the US. Some were working in offices together, but others were not. So it wasn't unusual for us to be able to work, be working apart from one another. But I would say what has changed is how we are interacting with each other. So there's a better focus now on video chatting, for example. And as a result of the company investing some more money and some of that technology and the bandwidth to be able to, to participate in that technology, we've been chatting more as a team with video chatting capabilities. And we've been having virtual happy hours once a week and playing online games with each other and trying to interact in a little bit different way, which I think is, is a, a good thing and will probably continue in the future even as we try and integrate back into offices again, I think some of this employee engagement that we were focusing on before is going to change and, and will be more effective for us, specifically my team, where we already spread out anyway. Uh, we're, we're focusing more on that employee engagement, which I think is a good result of, of this pandemic, if you can look on the bright side for something. Definitely, it, it seems like, you know, um, the pandemic definitely brought a lot of people together and, and really helped us all to focus on employee well-being. Um, so do you think that um, there will be lasting changes to how you work? It sounds like there will be um, from a mobility team perspective, but as a broader organisation. Sure, I, I think there will be some lasting changes. I think one thing we're doing as a company right now is developing a remote workforce policy, which we've never had before. We've never really had a need to because that wasn't our focus. But that's one thing that will certainly come out of this is a is a is a different workforce um, telecommuting policy. So that's one change that I think we'll see. I think certainly um, how we interact with our teams will continue to be different. And I really do think the discussions that we were having about employee engagement before were good, solid discussions. And I, I don't want to discredit them in any way, but I think you have a different, unique, almost I would say better way to focus on employee engagement now because you've really had to stop and pause for a moment and focus on priorities. What's important to people? What, what really matters to them? How are they managing and working through this? Are they healthy? Are they happy? More of a focus on, on the one, on the individual, um, which I think is a good change um, for us and, and will be a lasting change as well. It's definitely good to hear about some of the positives that people are taking away from this global pandemic. Um, thank you. Thank you, Marissa. So Katrina, I'm coming on to you. So in your role as CEO of a global organization, how would you say that 
COVID-19 has particularly impacted the, yourself and the wider car to see from a business perspective. Thanks. Yeah, I'll uh, certainly echo some of the things that, that both Don and Marissa said. Early on, it was all about how do we get people safely out of the office and working from home and how do we scramble and get them the technology that they need. If I handle this a little bit in reverse order and talk about long term and then work my way back to kind of day to day, I would say long term for us as more of a service organization versus a manufacturing organization, we absolutely will find that we have a lot more work from home opportunities in the long run than what we were thinking just a few months ago because our employee base has proven that they can work very productively from home long term. That excites me from a talent perspective because it opens up our thinking about where we can recruit the best people. And I think it will also allow us to retain the best people because we'll be thinking a lot more broadly about work from home. Now, the day to day, um, I thought might be more interesting to focus on for Cardis in terms of what we have done differently to manage the business, both within Cardis and within our parent company, Realogy. Many of you have heard us talk about Agile from a product development or a technology perspective, but it's actually a philosophy that you can use to run your entire business. And thankfully, my team had been trained on Agile by Rizwan Akhtar and Realogy had already been trained on Agile. So the reality is we have been running the business using Agile tools as soon as we all started having to work differently. And what that means literally is a 30 minute stand up meeting for myself and my team every morning. And that means a quick recitation from me of, okay, what are the key updates? What has, you know, what have we decided since yesterday? And then it's a focus not on everybody updating each other because we don't have time for that. It's a focus on what's critical for today and where do people need input or help from each other. And then it's all about divide and conquer. And then we will get back together the next morning or if necessary, we'll get back together at the end of the day if something is more critical than that. So it's very much allowed us to do a divide and conquer. And I've been emphasizing throughout Cardis the importance in these times to delegate, delegate, delegate. Uh, we have great teams. We need to trust our teams. Otherwise, there's no way we will be able to actually get things done. <laughs> Um, so I think that's been a key part of how we've changed our day to day. And then in this kind of crisis environment, communication becomes even more important. And we like to pride ourselves on communicating well. But in this case, we have used every technology tool we can get our hands on to do even more communications. So we're used to doing town hall type meetings. We've used tools like this to do live town hall type meetings. But in a global environment where I can't hit all time zones at once, I have also gone to a weekly video that I can send out by email. Um, it's it's both personal because it's me recording it from home, but it's also a way for me to be able to get some consistent messages out in a more personal way than just a, a cold email coming out every single week. And then the last point, which I think both Don and Marissa also talked to was, how do you keep things uh, somewhat normal, right? So how do you not lose track of some of those normal interactions when everybody has moved to remote and technology? And that's where I'll give huge credit to our distributed teams. They have used Yammer and tools like that to make sure that they are still building that team camaraderie. And then we made a conscious choice to keep a Cardis tradition called Bravo Day where we honor our frontline employees and we give recognition to them. They are uh, nominated by their VP and then we select the winners, but we honor all of the nominees. 
and then we have a bit of a team um, team building day. So we made sure that we kept that in the month of April, despite the fact that we had some skepticism about whether we should and whether we could possibly execute that in a virtual way. I thought it was really important to figure out how to do it as best we could in a virtual way so that we also kept that sense of normalcy in the crisis. Thanks, Katrina. Yeah, I think um, we're, we're probably most familiar with Agile being used from a tech technology perspective. Um, so really interesting to hear, I'm sure for everyone, what that means to you from, from a leadership and agile management perspective. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Alex, moving to you, you obviously work with such a vast um, variety of organizations spanning lots of different industry sectors. What innovative ideas or actions have you seen clients implement to support their relocating employees during the pandemic? Um, hi, everybody. I I'm pleased to share with you that um, we've certainly seen a lot of innovation across our broad client base um, in response to the pandemic. Having spoken also to many of my peers, uh, as well as my teams, I think we could broadly characterize the different type of support that has been developed as either emotional well-being support or practical support um, to relocating families. Um, from an employee well-being perspective specifically, what we have seen, as Dawn and Marissa mentioned, is a very um, significant laser focus on employee well-being and one-on-one -on -one connectivity. So we've seen a number of clients instigate touch base core campaigns, um, usually in collaboration with HR or employee care groups to really check in with the family, make sure that the employee is well, that they are coping, making sure that they remember the tools and options that they have available to them, such as employee um, assistance programs, and in many locations, also the provision of additional information or FAQs uh, that actually share with them a little bit more detail on online shopping options, yoga, um, and just general well-being sites to again help ease some of that transition into home working. However, there will be some employees who are actually experiencing much more acute challenges um, during this period, such as isolation, of course, uh, but many are having struggles balancing both work and childcare, as well as um, couple issues. So again, we've seen some very proactive steps to either provide referrals uh, for counseling online or to provide reimbursement for some of those services. Um, and then the final example I wanted to share with you on emotional well-being is uh, what we have called the, the care package. Um, now, this has been primarily um, for very hard hit locations such as China, um, where some of our client uh, partners have actually arranged for care packages to be delivered to those employees who are self-isolating. Um, the, the sort of typical composition of this type of care package would be um, staple dry products for the home, like rice and flour, um, coloring books for children, um, and of course those core necessities like hand gel, um, who are a, a very um, challenging um, to acquire at this particular point. And again, the emphasis is not necessarily on a huge cost or outlay for the organization, but actually employees have felt really overwhelmed positively um, by such a kind gesture from, from their organization. Um, and then I would say from a practical perspective, of course, the many different situations that we've encountered um, have certainly pushed us and our client base to look for innovative ways to, to deal with challenges. Um, one great um, development we've had has been in the space of temporary living. Um, where, of course, we found a number of employees halfway through that relocation point having to literally arrive, hit the ground and actually go straight into quarantine. Um, so with the support of our destination service network, we created a quarantine service package that actually included airport collection straight to the apartment, which had already had a very deep clean and which had been um, 
supplied, not just with a full food shop, but also cleaning equipment. Um, if the employee had, you know, necessities around internet connection, you know, additional dongles, etc., all of that was supplied in advance. And again, it, it was done very successfully. Um, and finally, I would add um, local property management for the host country. So where we had employees very suddenly be evacuated from host locations, uh, whether that was voluntarily or involuntarily, um, we engaged some DSP services to support with looking after those homes um, while they are vacant to ensure that they stay safe. Thanks, Alex. So do you think that some of these innovative ideas like the care package or the quarantine temporary living um, offering could be carried forward or redesigned, reinvented and continued in the long term? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I certainly think that many of these types of services um, will become staples of new business continuity planning um, that we do with our clients. Again, this has been fairly unprecedented. We've never had you know, the entire globe effectively going into lockdown. Um, but I think there are so many key learnings and different ways in which we can support assignees that we've learned about during this process. And we will absolutely be making sure that those options continue to be developed and become available for future emergency situations. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing some of those innovative ideas um, that we've you know, implemented to support some of the assignees. So um, talking about people on the site, then I'll, I'll come back to you, John. How did you go about evaluating your in-progress moves, like Alex was talking about, to determine the best course of action for each individual? For example, continuing the assignment or perhaps having to repatriate the person early. Um, mm -hmm. how, how did you go about that? Sure, thank you, Ashley. So again, as I mentioned, uh, Toyota's focus is always going to first and foremost be um, on team member well-being and safety, far far and above uh, what what the business uh, needs may be. So our decisions are always going to be made first and foremost looking through that lens. So as the COVID situation began to emerge, our first per priority was on our global population. And we very quickly made the decision to provide our expats and their families with the opportunity to return to the US. And about half of them chose to do so. We provided airfare, temporary lodging, a rental vehicle, and a small stipend to each returning family, made sure that they got settled. And certainly, uh, Cardis was instrumental in helping us do that, which happened relatively quickly, pretty much over one weekend. We also then assessed the pending assignments and made the decision to delay these just based on the conditions around the globe and the uncertainty at that time it really made no sense to move forward with any of those and in some of those cases the timing was such to alex's point that the team member had already moved out of their home the team member and the family had already vacated their home so we really had to look to provide temporary living support for those families as well so at this time, we um, are hopeful that we can continue some of these. We, we can resume some of these um, assignments that have been pending, perhaps in July or August if conditions permit. But we're going to continue to monitor that. And the decisions are really going to be made based on the what's in the best interest of our team members in terms of safety and well-being. And yes, we did have some scheduled repatriations as well. Um, so some of those assignments we ended early. Uh, based on business need, some were extended, um, and some are continuing to repatriate as scheduled. And in the cases where these team members have already returned to their home location and they, they now are going to repatriate, we're actually, actually initiating remote repatriations, which of course is a whole new experience for us um, and our team. So we're working through those details, uh, partnering closely with CARDIS, of course, and our destination services providers to really move through a virtual repatriation. So as I said, we're continuing to con continuing to monitor the conditions around the world to, to determine when condi conditions permit us to safely resume some level of normal activity. And, and you know, as the months have passed, and things are are beginning or continuing to emerge, I should say, 
Uh, we're still considering team member safety first and foremost. We are continuing to communicate with our team members to ensure that they're receiving information and support they need. Uh, lots of anxiety out there and interestingly enough, our, our team members are most of them very anxious to resume activity despite the fact that there's still so much uncertainty um, in many of our host locations. So we're really trying to manage through this with them, manage their expectations. Um, and, and ensure that they maintain engagement with their current activity. So as things are evolving, we're now considering timing and business need as we make these decisions. We're partnering with our home business units and our host locations to, to ensure that we're also taking in, into consideration what their needs are and what, what timing might be best for them as well. So that was our global population. So after we initially got that population settled, we began to assess our domestic activity. We had a couple of key initiatives underway at the time, including a group move involving the consolidation of 33 field locations into three. So we knew that some of that activity would have to continue because that was a, a very critical business initiative. But we initially paused most of the activity in order to really get a handle on the entire population. Uh, where were we in you know, the various stages of these relocations? So the mobility team compiled a report um, that included every single file and its status, and we put those into categories. On hold, meaning we'd re we had received a relocation request, but it had not been initiated. Um, pending, which means we had received and initiated the file, but no activity, significant activity had begun. And then those that we considered in process where the file had been initiated, initiated and key activities had were underway or had been completed. So we then worked with our business units to identify within these categories, which relocations were business critical. And as you all might imagine, the, the business units said they're all business critical. Um, so our next step to help address that um, and really begin to begin to distinguish between these files because we knew we couldn't move forward with all of them for various reasons, we implemented a tool to help us make these make these decisions. So in partnership with our our relocation companies, we developed a very detailed matrix that lists all of the states and the key areas of consideration, uh, such as travel restrictions, school closings, real estate activities, appraisals, things of that nature that we would use to evaluate whether or not we could or should move forward with a relocation. And based on this information, we have designated each of our Toyota locations as green, yellow, or red, meaning, you know, uh, green is ready to go, yellow is caution, we need to kind of look at that further, or red, that location is not ready. Um, and then we've included the Toyota workplace readiness, so meaning in the location where the team member is going to be moving, is that Toyota location ready to accept that team member? Um, is the facility open? Are there any issues that we need to consider in the in the Toyota workplace? And then, of course, equally important, is the team member ready? So we've included Toyota workplace readiness and team member readiness as two additional considerations in this matrix. It's updated regu regularly and will assist us in evaluating our relocations and determining which we should move forward with. And I think this has helped us remove some of the subject subjectivity of determining which locations are business critical, which are not, by providing some qualitative data to help us make our decisions. Um, so that tool we are just beginning to use um, and feel that that's really going to help us um, in some of those discussions with the business unit where we might have discrepancies and opinions about what is business critical and what is not. So those are the, some of the things that we, we have uh, put in place as the situation has unfolded. Thanks, Dawn. Um, thanks for sharing all of that information. Um, Marissa, as you've worked through the, these sort of challenging times, 
thinking, sort of starting to look ahead as the world starts to emerge from the crisis, what are you planning with regards to recovery? Sure. So uh, first of all, I could just go back to what I had said initially. You know, some some of our business lines have defense contracts that we had to continue to fulfill. So we had very few expats that that came home. Some of them got stuck in some locations just because they happened to have come back to the US for a surgery, for example, and then the country that they were supposed to return to shut down unexpectedly and they couldn't get back. Um, we did offer to allow families to repatriate, but in countries uh, where we had to where we had a contract that we needed to fulfill, we did ask the employees to stay in country and we only had a handful that were really nervous about doing that. Most of them had access, relatively good access to, to medical care and they felt comfortable staying. So we didn't have a lot of repatriations. We do have a few people stuck in some locations that we will have to get unstuck. One of the interesting things that we've had to continue to do is to get people in country even during the crisis. So in instances where we had a handful of people who weren't comfortable staying, but we still had a contract that we had to fulfill, we ended up having to send people back to that location and it was a bit of a challenge to get them there. So um, we had folks going to Japan who worked under a SOFA contract, with, which is a status of forces agreement, allows them to get in country without having to have a work permit but they got stuck on their way there and had to quarantine in an entirely different country altogether for 14 days before they could carry on to Japan. We had a couple of people come home from Mexico, for example, and thankfully Mexico is one of those locations where you can go in country and legally work on an FMM visa for up to six months. So we were able to identify quickly some individuals who were willing to go and, and backfill some of those individuals, some on a temporary basis, some have been sent more permanently to that location. Um, we also have contracts in Iraq and Afghanistan where those individuals are embedded with the military. Some of them evacuated just prior to the COVID pandemic because of safety issues. There were rocket launches and various um, other issues happening in Iraq. So we pulled those folks out um, from a safety perspective. And then they got caught up in the COVID pandemic and couldn't go back in. So Iraq is supposed to make a decision this weekend whether or not they are going to open up their country again. And we're rapidly working on trying to get those folks proper visas to enter the country. So we've got a lot of activities still happening. We have a lot of assignments that are still moving forward just because of the fact that we have these defense contracts. We certainly had some assignments that have been canceled or put on hold as a result of the pandemic. We have a, a group that is um, more focused on the commercial side, and they've really had to sit and evaluate their sales force and their workforce outside of um, outside of the U.S. to understand uh, what is the business need and do we really need that many um, salespeople in country when, when we may not be selling that many products right now. We've had individuals contacting us for our small branch offices that my team supports to say, hey, we need to do a furlough or a reduced, a reduced work week in this particular location. How can we do that legally? So my team has been doing research and helping them in that regard. So we've been doing a lot of work, um, getting folks in country, putting some people on pause, trying to rescue some that have, have gotten themselves stuck in a various location. And then of course, we've been dealing with furloughs and reduced work weeks as well. So I think those efforts will probably continue going forward as we try and stabilize everything. Uh, one of the things we're doing is we're trying to get ready for assignments that will be that are in queue right now, but haven't been able to get started because of immigration issues. So the host country consulate is closed. They're not processing work permits right now. The country's border is closed, but they'll be reopening some in the next week or two. Germany is one in particular that I'm thinking of where we have some assignments that are queued up to go. We haven't been able to get them an appointment at the consulate yet because the consulate has been closed, but we've been told that if we can get the individual's name and birth date on a particular list to get them queued up, that they will be one of the first cases that are hopefully processed. So we're doing everything we can to get the relocation ready for the, these individuals and doing everything we can to try and get them queued up so that they're among some of the first immigration cases that are processed. I do think that as a business, we're going to see some challenges with just saying to ourselves, 
We can manage everything remotely. We don't need expats or we can hire locally and be just fine because some of our contracts, as I've mentioned before, um, contain proprietary information associated with the military. One of the requirements of the job is that a U.S. national perform the work. Um, we have our aircraft uh, business, Cessna uh, and, and Hawker Beechcraft airplanes, where in order to work on those airplanes, you have to have FAA certification. So we had been developing and we had done for a year a program where we had hired individuals outside of the U.S. on a local payroll. We had brought them into the U.S. We were training them for a year time period, getting them FAA certified and then sending them back to their home countries to be able to work on our aircraft in those locations. And we had another wave of that program ready to start in August. And of course, now we're not sure, are we going to be able to get the H3 training visas for those individuals to be able to bring them in country so we can train them and get them certified to send them back out to work on our aircraft? If that can't happen, then I think we're still going to have to focus on sending short term assignees out, at least in the interim, to fulfill those roles since those folks would be U.S. nationals that are FAA certified already. So either short term uh, assignments or frequent business travelers to try and address some of those needs. So we'll be trying to, to work through all of that uh, and make sure that we can have critical boots on the ground and locations where we will continue to need them as a business. Thanks, Marissa. Uh, Katrina, coming uh, back to you, um, uh, given your experience on the board and as part of the executive team for several organizations, are you able to share any broader observations or key learnings on how companies are adjusting during the, the pandemic or this challenging time? Sure. Um, it's been interesting talking with other CEOs and then, as you said, I, I serve on the board of a, an industrial goods company that is very global also. And in the short term, there's an interesting talent discussion that I think a lot of us have had, which is in a crisis, boy, it becomes so important to lean hard on people's strengths and to very consciously think about, are we playing to everybody's strengths? and spend a lot less time thinking about uh, their development areas right now <laughs> because in a crisis you just want to have the best people and the best skill sets focused in the right areas so in some cases we've actually asked highly talented people to go focus on something slightly different because what we need to do is really fully leverage their strengths right now um, so that's been an interesting one that has come up across lots of different industries, just kind of an HR and, and talent observation in these unique times. Um, then I'd say talking to a number of folks who are in more of those service type industries or where they have more office workers, there's a lot of really great creative thinking and discussion going on about to the points that have already been raised, I don't think any of us love the notion of everybody working remotely all the time because there's so much benefit to human interaction, collaboration, and the online collaboration tools just aren't quite the same. So therefore, I think it has triggered a really creative conversation about when exactly do we need people together to do what? And how do we think creatively about what those spaces could be? Because they don't have to be the traditional concept of office spaces or conference rooms. They could be renting a hotel uh, space out or a space in a shopping mall or movie theaters when they reopen and having people sit every second or third seat. You know, there are some very creative ways that people are thinking about getting that human collaboration back in place in a safe way. Um, so I think that has been great to take part in those conversations. On more of the manufacturing side, the company where I serve on the board has been really uh, thinking deeply about this and proactive. So they have laid out some of their manufacturing lines differently already in order to get more mm. distancing. 
probably even more important than that, they have decided that until there's a vaccine, they need to have a global expertise on being able to start up and shut down plants very efficiently, uh, quickly and efficiently, because they just know that they're going to have to multiple times shut down and start up. So in a company that has normally been uh, very decentralized and let each plant manager really run things locally. This is one area where they have chosen to be more centralized. So they've worked with their plant managers and developed a playbook that everybody can follow to do a quick shutdown and a quick efficient startup. And then they were kind enough to share that back with an industry group called MAPI, which is Manufacturers Association for uh, Productivity and Innovation. They you know, scrubbed it a little bit and then shared it as something that other people can learn from. And then uh, similar, not quite as extreme as what you were describing, Marissa, where it doesn't have to be a US citizen in some of these other countries around the world, but they have expertise around lean manufacturing and 80-20 where they've been accustomed to being able to apply that expertise to their global manufacturing footprint just through having people willing to get on airplanes all the time and lead a globe trotting lifestyle. Well, they're now looking at it saying we can't count on that sort of global travel for the next year or two. So they're actually looking at um, relocations that they would not have envisioned six months ago because they need to say how do we have that level of expertise in each subregion within driving distance because we can probably count on driving more than we can count on flying either the reality of it being open or just people's comfort with it so they're actually looking at relocating a number of employees so that they can get that expertise coverage at least for the next year or two within driving distance perfect thank you so much for sharing the variety of different things that are going on across the various industry sectors. Um, I'm conscious of the time and we've got quite a few questions come through on the Q&A from our listeners. So I'll jump to some of those. I'll start with the highest rated question. I'm sure nobody has the exact answer to this question, but um, the question is, what do you think will be the longer term impact of COVID-19 on the mobility industry? Quite a broad question. So, um, Dawn, if it's okay, I'll, I'll come to you um, first and ask, um, I guess, as it relates to your particular program, do you foresee changes in your um, assignee demographics, for example, different news patterns, things like that as a result? I think that is to be determined. Um, I think it's going to be a tough sell for an organization that um, operates in a very traditional model. Um, it's going to be about how do we help them see things differently? How do we help change their mindset around we can accomplish the same business objective, but do that in a different way? So I think it's going to be really the responsibility of the mobility teams to be able to provide that expertise to engage the business in those discussions to really help them see that they're this that the support that we can provide the advisory role that we can play is going to help them see things differently um, and what that looks like you know who knows you know I, I think a lot of this does go back to our team members going to be willing to go on these assignments anymore so I think there's going to be a lot of different drivers that come into play that we're going to have to really sit down and go into much deeper conversations around strategy outcomes and how we get there with our business units. Definitely and I think um, all of the things that Katrina was saying about agility and the need for flexibility in these times will definitely play a, a big role going forward I'm sure for everyone involved in the industry and running mobility programs. Um, the second question, or the second highest rated question, um, was also for, for Don and Marissa. So Marissa, I'll, I'll throw this one over to you. Um, have you already, um, or do you plan to make lasting changes to your mobility policy as a result of some of your experiences over sure. the last three months? Sure. 
So one of the things that we already had on our docket to develop and work on in 2020 was a points based policy. And I think that that has been pushed up even faster as a priority that we are focusing on because I think and, and a points based policy for our long term assignees, I should say. I think uh, lots of companies have gone to a points based model for localizations, but the long term experts are really our, our largest population and probably won't change. Um, just given some of the contracts and pricing that we have in queue right now, I, I don't see that changing. So we're really going to try and focus on that population, but I think even more so now we need to have an approach or an ability to add more flexibility for these assignees. So if they aren't comfortable sending their family or if they're going to have some personal issues that they're dealing with or concerns that they have to address as a result of this virus or just the changing um, workplace as it stands right now, we're going to try and add some more flexibility for them to be able to address some of those concerns. And I do think just to go back to the first question a little bit that was asked just a minute ago, some of the changes that we're going to see just generally in the mobility space, I think will continue. So things like how does a DSP interact with an individual? We may not be sending folks on home finding trips anymore. We may be asking the DSP to give them virtual tours or um, the mortgage industry, for example, when you're talking about closing on a home, we may not need to send people into a, a banking institution anymore. I think some of those things that have come up and been developed new creative ideas for how to do business as a result of this pandemic will continue. And again, I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. I think it is going to shape this industry a bit and help us focus on being more flexible and more agile. So for us, um, for Textron, and it's that points based policy and then I think probably continuing to implement and utilize some of the resources that we've been able to take advantage of right now that Cardis has been helping us with. And I will say too with the points based policy, we don't have a platform for it right now. So we are definitely leaning heavily on Cardis and their Move Pro 360 technology to work with their teams to build out that platform for Textron. Great, thanks. Thanks for answering the question, um, Marissa. The next one, I guess, is applicable to everyone. Um, for those working from home, has there been an obvious lower, higher, or the same level of productivity shown? Um, so since it's applicable to everyone, Katrina, I guess I'll, I'll come to you first to, to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at, at this point, we believe we have the same level of productivity. We have seen, we can measure actually higher levels of transferee satisfaction uh, service scores. We have not put in place some of the things that you read about in terms of invasive uh, technology to try to measure productivity that way. So we're, we're just measuring productivity the way we typically would look at, you know, how many uh, transferees is somebody handling during a day. Uh, we seem to have made that transition at the same levels of productivity and higher service levels. Perfect. Um, Dawn or Marissa, do you have anything to add to that? No, I I agree with Katrina's remarks. Um, again, for a company that has never really worked remotely, this has been an, a very eye-opening experience. And I think the good news is we've really proven to ourselves that we can do it. Right. It, it's yes, we can still be productive and in many ways, yes, even more productive. Um, but I think the balance now between uh, managing that work from home, which people are not accustomed to with their personal life. Right. So now you're in your home, you're working, you've got your children there. There's more distractions. I think really maneuvering through those new new challenges has been something that our, our team members have had to wrestle with. But I th think, um, again, the, the good news is we've proven to ourselves that we can be resilient, we can be agile, and we can do all of that from home. And, and I would just add too, I think um, as a manager, you really have to define, redefine what success looks like. So if success before was somebody sitting in their chair for eight hours doing a job, that has to go out the window once you once you have this remote workforce. And I think for us, we've been able to really sit down and say, what does success look like? What does it mean? What are you supposed to accomplish in a day? As a manager, I think it's my job to say, 
here are the new goals and objectives, right? Here's how things are changing. Here's the needs that the businesses have at this point in time. Here's how we're going to shift what you're doing. And then, then asking the team to, to perform and changing what success looks like and how you measure uh, what they're doing. I, I think that that really has shifted for us. Yeah. And then if I if I could add on to that, Ashley, I think the um, the other thing we've all touched on is we've made that transition in the short term, actually probably better than we would have guessed. Um, that doesn't mean our work is done. I think we all also have to come back and make that sustainable. Uh, and I know Alex hit on it and Don, you were <laughs> hitting on it too with the reference to you know, kind of mental health and family and work-life balance. We have not necessarily crossed the bridge in terms of what technology setup is required at home, what other support is required for it to actually be sustainable. So I think short term, yeah, we've made that transition better than we would have expected and with strong productivity, but I, I think there's still more, more work to be done if we were to make that more sustainable in the long run. I, I think definitely. Um, oh, sorry, Alex. Go on. If I may, I do think we, um, as Katrina mentioned, we still have some way before we can really see the the change in behaviors and priorities of our customers as well. That will come about undoubtedly from this experience of being cooped up at home with with their children. Um, so certainly, you know, you you will read in the news a lot around. You know, changing attitudes towards housing um, and whether that is you know retaining home country housing whether it is ensuring that host country housing has you know its own space and, and ability I think will be um, very much at the forefront of any work that we undertake in terms of uh, you know the development of policies moving forward and just the, the really one um, additional item I did want to call out that I think we should all watch very closely is education. Um, because again, in the same way in which we've been grappling with working from home, certainly children of relocating employees have also been grappling with um, home learning. And the e-learning industry was already a huge industry. Um, expected to be worth, I think, somewhere around 325 billion uh, by 2025. But certainly through this crisis, we've seen public and private schools really push their curriculums um, online and creating tools and mechanisms the same way we are um, to keep that momentum uh, for learning. So I think that will be very interesting for us in Relo. We have been traditionally tied down by, you know, the usual term time um, volume patterns. And I do think that there is likely to be some opportunities for older children to perhaps finish or start term time um, remotely. So again, this is just, um, you know, something to bear in mind. But if it does indeed move in that direction, I think that could actually be a positive um, you know, for everyone in the mobility industry because of those traditional time pressures that we've seen uh, around term times. Thanks, Alex, and to everyone for chipping in and answering that question. Um, so we're coming up to the end of the hour. Um, there are still quite a few questions that people have asked, which is great, So we, but we won't have a chance to get to all of them today. So as I said at the beginning of the session, we'll circle back with our presenters um, we'll get their perspectives on the questions, the top rated questions, and we'll send out some information afterwards to everyone who joined us today. Before we wrap up, I'd just like to say thank you so much to Don Lugavro, Mar Marissa Johnson, Katrina Helmkamp, and Alex Harris for being such fantastic panelists, for sharing their insights, and for really bringing all of these topics to life for us today. So I think um, all that remains is to say thank you so much to everyone who joined the session. As a reminder, you will find a recording of this session along with all of the others on our COVID-19 hub on Cartus.com. And actually all of our webinars will be available as audio only downloads for anyone who just wants to listen to it as a podcast. So keep a lookout for our next webinar and we hope to see you soon.